Greetings, Psyonigator Caps, and welcome to Codex Compliant. For the first episode of 2021, we've got something a little bit different for you. Throughout this series, we've mentioned Games Workshop's official magazine, White Dwarf, many times. But after much painstaking research, and by that we mean going into our local WH Smiths, we have discovered that other magazines do, in fact, exist. Stop us if we're going too fast. Over the years, some of these magazines have even contained their own Warhammer 40,000 content. Today, we're going to take a look at one of those old magazines, because that sounds like a fun way to use our limited time on this spinning ball of pain we call home. Last year's been pretty rough, hasn't it? Anyway, the magazine we're going to be taking a look at today is Challenge. And no, we didn't buy issue 69 as a joke, it just happened to be the cheapest one on eBay, and it was a happy little accident. Running from 1986 to 1995, Challenge covered sci-fi role-playing games and was put out by the tabletop game publisher, Game Designers Workshop. A company that we erroneously said was British in an old video, but was in fact from the United States. Normal Illinois specifically, in case you were wondering. A place with an ironically unusual name. One interesting thing about Challenge Magazine is that it didn't start at issue 1. Game Designers Workshop, or GDW as we'll say from now on to avoid the mouthful, originally had a magazine called The Journal of the Traveller's Aid Society to support Traveller, a sci-fi RPG they published at the time. The journal ran for 24 issues before being replaced with Challenge. However, to maintain continuity between the two magazines, they decided to have Challenge carry on the issue numbering from the journal, meaning that Challenge started at issue 25. You see, this is how you can tell that Challenge belongs in this series. We're only a few minutes into the video and already someone has specifically chosen to be more confusing than necessary. Challenge would continue to cover Traveller. In fact, in the beginning, they would put their Traveller content in its own easily removable section, complete with journal branding and cover art. But it would also feature numerous other sci-fi games that GDW published, like 2300 AD, Space 1889, Twilight 2000, and, we assume, some other games that didn't have years in the title. This was later expanded into games they didn't publish, like Shadowrun, Battletech, and Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader. This content would take on various forms, whether it be articles simply discussing elements of the games, to whole new adventures, new items, new factions, etc. All with unique art and a decidedly off-brandness that gave it a unique charm. Plus, its definition of sci-fi RPG was pretty broad, so a lot of different games showed up in it. And we thought it would be a lark to go through those unofficial Warhammer 40,000 articles and make an unreasonably long video talking about every single one of them. I mean, it's not like any of you can stop us. Issue 36 from 1988 contains the first 40k article from Challenge, and is also the one you're most likely to have already heard about. Sunstroke was a scenario containing the all-female Space Marine chapter, The Little Sisters of Purification. Quick side note, the next section contains talk of female Space Marines, so let's all be grown-ups in the comments, yeah? The Little Sisters existing is usually the only thing you'll see mentioned from this article, so let's go into a little bit more detail about everything else in there. The scenario itself is a bit of a strange one. An alien craft has landed on the planet Lucas, a craft full of Jukero. You know, the tech-savvy alien race that look exactly like orangutans because 40k is a very serious science fiction setting. Upon the planet, they have uncovered a Slan teleporter, and a small group of space marines from the Little Sisters of Purification chapter are sent to investigate with some tech priests in tow. Going through the teleporter, they find themselves on an old Slan experimental station, built into an asteroid close to the system's sun. Turns out that the station has been manipulating the sun and making Lucas inhabitable, but the Jukero were trying to convert it into a starship, meaning that if they succeed, then the planet's inhabitants will all die. If the Jukero know about this, then they seem not to care. So the Marines must defeat the Jukero on the station without too much damage being done to the buildings and equipment, all the while keeping their tech priests alive. Because if they die, then no one will be left to fix what the bad monkey men have done to the station, and the people of Lucas will be burnt to a crisp. That's the broad strokes, but there's quite a lot to it. Like how each structure on the station has specific functions and quirks, whether it be something relatively unimportant, like Building 3, the Canteen, or something incredibly important, like the station's force field generators, which take the form of a series of rib-like structures that will zap anything that comes close. Also, Buildings 13 and 14 are full of what is described as extremely esoteric devices, 
And if anyone but a Jukero or Tech Priest messes with them, then there's a 5% chance the sun will just go Nova right then and there. Now, of course you probably want to hear more about the Little Sisters themselves. Well, there's not a huge amount of background, but the chapter is said to be one of several all-female chapters that dates back to the early days of the Imperium, and their practices are stated to be steeped in ritual. They swear vows of obedience to the Emperor, as well as vows of chastity, because how can a woman be mentioned without bringing up if you can have sex with them or not? Their motto is Castitus Humilitas et Honor, meaning chastity, humility, and honor, and their armor is black with white iconography. Looking at the art, many of them sport top knots on their armor, and they lack the usual backpacks. Although the latter seems to be more of a quirk of the way they draw marines in challenge. They usually just don't have them for whatever reason. The three named little sisters we get are named after three virtues. Modesty, Chastity, and Electra. <laughs> And joking about the author's odd obsession with their chastity aside, it is nice that they are presented as just being like any other marine chapter. Even describing a pair of marines making a bet on if the teleporter will just send them into the heart of the sun, showing that they have the same type of gallows humour often seen in other marines. Although perhaps the strangest thing about the whole scenario is that one of the Jakero is actually a vampire named Shkleen. And that's a rogue trader vampire who are life force draining polymorph Batman. He's been hiding in the form of a Jakero for many years, although not a particularly popular one it seems. And he thinks it'll be fun to see a planet get destroyed. It's not particularly relevant to anything else happening, but he will try to infiltrate the human side if things look bad for the apes. All this makes for a pretty dense first article, and there's a lot more we haven't mentioned, but we have a lot more to cover, so let's get on to the next one. With issue 37, we got one of the more intriguing unofficial additions to 40k lore in the Undead of Space, a group that look a lot like the Legion of the Damned but were entirely unrelated. If you're curious, the Legion of the Damned White Dwarf article came out about a year before this did. So the Undead were a group of warriors created by the Emperor when the Imperium was still young. Despite looking similar to Space Marines, the process of creating them was quite different, largely revolving around an implant being placed into each trooper's brain. This implant augmented their abilities and drew its power from the psychic power of the universe and even from the Emperor himself. This meant the trooper no longer needed to eat or even breathe, being sustained by this energy. However, the device had its side effects. Namely that the recipient's skin, organs, and tissue would wither away, leaving only a skeleton. We'd, we know it's daft, just roll with it. These skeleton warriors fought the enemies of the Imperium for two centuries, expanding the borders of the Imperium until they got so far out that contact was lost. They simply disappeared into the void. Over time, they became little more than a memory, a story to frighten children with. However, the Emperor knew that one day they would return, stripped of their humanity, driven mad by the fact that both their life and death was robbed from them, and waiting to wreak vengeance upon the armies of the Imperium. And, yeah, they're back. So, as well as the backstory, it told you how to convert your own undead. In short, you smashed together the RTB01 Space Marine box and some fantasy skeletons. The more disorganized, the better. It also gave stats for them, along with a trio of scenarios in which to use them. Two of them involved being accidentally awoken from their tombs, because yeah, they sorta did the whole Necron tomb world thing years before the Necrons did. Honestly, although the being an army of psychically powered skeletons thing is a little silly, even for 40k, the general idea of them being another one of the Emperor's screw-ups coming back to haunt him and dooming everyone because of his short-sightedness is very fitting for the setting. I mean, the Emperor forgets people have feelings and makes them mad enough to kill literally everyone is pretty much the basis of the entire Horus Heresy series. There were two articles in issue 40. The first, Garrison Duties, gave us a page of new scenarios based on the more mundane and tedious tasks of those maintaining Imperial rule. Quite a few involved surprise inspections from Inquisitors or the Administratum, but they also included things like outbreaks of Birmingham speckled leprosy and much less terrible things, like volcanoes. Basically, it's ideas that lean harder on the role-playing aspect of old 40k rather than solely giving excuses for two armies to beat each other up. Also, not quite sure what's going on with how this marine is holding their gun. Like, is he reloading it, or what? In the other article, The Emperor's Bag of Tricks, there were some fun new bits of equipment to play with, which, I mean, makes sense, seeing as issue 40 was the special equipment issue after all. Some of the items included are 
Air sponges, an alien sponge that absorbs so much air it can be used to suffocate all within a two inch radius. Try not to think about it too much, it's fine. Attraction slash repulsion field generators, devices able to move other objects around without touching them. One use being to mount them on a vehicle covered in spikes and pulling enemies towards it. I mean, like, I, I don't know, a, a gun seems a bit more convenient? Ground glaze, which is, look, it's military grade lube, okay? And psionigator caps, a weird alien originally found on a Tyranid ship that can protect you from psychic attacks when worn on your head. Wise marine chapters require their men to wear them. I mean, I don't know, but I don't think it's going to catch on. Issue 41 would contain another new Space Marine chapter, the Ice River Guards. Hailing from the planet of New Coventry, a planet described as being a cross between an extreme arctic wilderness and a death world that was populated by a plethora of unfriendly life forms. The real Coventry, a mostly unremarkable city in England, is neither a death world nor an arctic wilderness. However, having only been there once, I can't really comment on the prevalence of unfriendly life forms. The Ice River Guards specialise their companies to fighting in different situations. Company A, for example, is specialised for combat in wooded areas. It even painstakingly gives us the stats and equipment for the entirety of the company for reasons we cannot truly fathom. Seriously, it details every single marine. So we know that the 9th Squad is equipped nearly entirely with power axes, which is admittedly neat. The art shows them as pretty spiky too, very prickly characters. The colour scheme of this chapter is, uh, it's, well I mean we don't want to be rude, but it's, it's a mess? So they are ultramarine blue with a wavy stripe down either side of pea green, then a brown stripe down the centre of that. The widths of the stripes indicate their rank. Don't think anyone tried to paint this before writing about it. The artwork seems to only vaguely reflect this description, which might be a case of the artist reading what was written and trying desperately to make it less bad. Oh, and also their symbol is a tricolored waterfall. We assume they mean this symbol we see tattooed on this guy's head, although which three colors it's supposed to be or how they're used is a mystery to all but the author. I mean, maybe, possibly something like this? Who knows? Another fun thing we've noticed is that Tim Bradstreet, the artist for this article and several of the other articles we've covered, seems to have a bit of a habit of giving his characters a septum piercing and a singular earring. Well, apart from the undead guy, seeing as he doesn't really have a nose, but I mean, he's still got the singular earring, though. The article from issue 42, The Inquisitor Beast, is an interesting beast since you start reading it and assume that it's fanfiction because it just launches straight into a story, but then you get to the end of the first page and you realise no, this is a choose your own adventure. Actually not just that, it's better. It's one of those choose your own adventures where you get to roll dice. My time has come. You play as Inquisitor Beast hunting down the renegade tech priest Golan. He's been tracked down to a sewer system and you must tackle the various perils of such a place, from unhelpful locals to secret orcs to getting pelted with garbage. Eventually, provided you don't get yourself killed, you'll find Golan and depending on how thorough you were, you'll get one of three endings that range from your boss giving you a big pat on the back to, well, we'll just read you the bad ending. With such failure at competence presented by an Inquisitor of the Imperium, if the Emperor ever learns of your story, it is quickly forgotten. Jesus. A fun little touch is that Vist is actually given full stats, so he was playable in 40k at the time. The stats aren't used in the Choose Your Own Adventure either, in case you're wondering. They're just an extra little thing. These stats also show that he always carries a book written by his boss, Master Inquisitor Gamera Fox. Which I mention purely because it's probably a reference to the famous giant turtle, friend to children, and container of meat, Gamera. But it uses the specific spelling of Gamera with two M's that's from the US cut of the first film that wasn't really ever used again. I'm not going anywhere with this, it's just something I noticed and I don't get to show off how many hours I've wasted watching kaiju movies very often. If you want to see how the whole thing shakes out, we've recorded a video playing through it that we'll put up sometime after this video goes live, so, you know, check that out if you're into such things. In short, it's a fun little thing and it's nice to have something in one of these that's just easy to experience without having to learn an entire obsolete game system. I just wish there was more dice rolling in it since there's not actually that much in here and I like dice. 
Just for completeness' sake, we'll also mention here that the next issue, issue 43, contained an article called Balancing Space Hulk. It's not 40k proper, and all it really does is bring up some suggestions to balance the game a little better, but we thought it was best to bring it up. Mostly since it contains this piece of artwork that makes us ask a lot of questions, like, is that Terminator about to grab that gene stealer's ass? The answer, we believe, is yes. In issue 44, we once again got two articles. The first was Warhammer by the Numbers, which was an early example of that thing where you work out how well a unit would do on average in an engagement against another enemy, using maths. It uses these kinds of calculations to work out some places where the balance within Rogue Trader wasn't great, and suggesting solutions, like how after working out that masses of cheap orcs would likely overpower the equivalent points value of Space Marines, they suggest making a rule that limits the number of models on the table. It's all rather dry, but, you know, it makes sense. Such things are annoying to players, and finely tuned balance within 40k didn't seem to be the highest priority for its creators at the time. Plus, these sorts of problems are more pronounced when you don't have many models on the table, and Rogue Trader was much smaller in scale than modern 40k. Although interestingly, they suggest implementing an Overwatch rule that would allow you to shoot at an enemy during their own movement phase if you didn't move or fire in your own turn, and a vaguely similar Overwatch rule would actually end up in 40k a few years later in the Battle Manual. The second article, Ot Spug Grub, was a mini-scenario campaign, which just means it's three small games linked together by a narrative. And no, we're not 100% sure what the spug of Ot Spug Grub is supposed to mean. I mean, I, I don't think it's supposed to mean House Sparrow. Anyway, the campaign follows a squad of orcs being sent down in a drop pod to the planet of Grork, and is told from the perspective of Hungry Boy Throg Bullneck. They land near a damaged Space Marine drop pod full of space sharks, and Throg just can't wait to meet them. No, wait, the script says, eat them. He can't wait to eat them. Dispatching them, the orcs move on to the second encounter where they fight some more marines with the help of an ill-defined orc war machine, before ambushing a camp made of regular Imperial troopers in the final encounter. Two things of note are, that the ship the space sharks arrive on is called the Star Shark, a name that is somehow even sillier than the name Space Sharks, and... That is just fantastic. We also get a couple of new orc nicknames for humans. Space Marines are Iron Butts, and more conventionally armoured humans are called Skinny Butts, and no, the Zeds are not optional. In issue 47, god damn it, that cover is the raddest I've ever seen. Anyway, in issue 47 we got An Eye for an Eye, another article that establishes a new Space Marine chapter via the medium of a scenario. The Emperor's Eyes were a Space Marine Legion during the Horus Heresy who were split down the middle, with Marines who sided with their leader Fasarius supporting Horus, and the rest siding with their chief librarian Arcan and the Imperium. Yeah, there's a little bit of Dark Angels about these lads. After a battle between the factions broke out on their homeworld of Ocula, the traitors escaped on a previously captured Orc Space Hulk, but were eventually driven into the Eye of Terror along with the rest of Horus's forces the Eye of Terror being the very place the Emperor's Eyes were made to watch over. In the millennia since the Heresy, the loyal Emperor's Eyes began calling themselves the Watchful Eyes, and changed their symbol, but retained the orange and red colour scheme of the original Legion. They follow the Index Astartes, which means in a modern sense they're a Codex-compliant chapter. <laughs> they said the thing and so are fairly unremarkable as far as Space Marine forces go. The traitors, however, change things up a smidge more. Now known as the Eyes of Doom, the traitors, still led by Fasarius, have adopted the Eye of Horus as their symbol and are entirely made up of Devastator squads. You could say they want to wreak a little havoc. Do you get it? Because because Chaos Devastators are called Havocs. It's funny! Marred by mutation, they also retained their original colour scheme, but often in a grotesque parody of the original shades. So Cornate Eyes of Doom would replace the orange with brass, and the Selenishi Marines were pink and would add yellow to the orange pads while edging it in green, which... is a choice. The scenario itself was simple enough. A platoon of watchful eyes land on an asteroid after detecting a mysterious signal coming from it. They find a downed and abandoned Eyes of Doom ship and are ambushed by its crew before they can reach their shuttle to leave. Then war happens. 40,000. Issue 48 contained an interesting article about Orc tactics. 
interesting in that each section has an in-universe introduction by the Orc Scarbad Grimorc, followed by an out-of-universe explanation by Craig Sheely. I mean, Scarbad would have also been Sheely, but y y you know what I mean. So Scarbad would say something like, Yeah, well, what's there to say? You see the enemy and whips him, right? Of course, you Yubis like to talk about strategy and like that, and you waste too much time and talk on it. An orc just drops the enemy a good and doesn't worry about how he went and did it. Which, somehow, is the introduction to a section on movement and manoeuvring, where effective ways to position your orc force on the battlefield are discussed. Of course, it's not particularly useful now, since both orcs and the entire game have had many revamps since this article was published, but it is interesting to see their strengths and weaknesses back then. For example, the hand-to-hand -hand section discusses how, despite their enthusiasm for it, orcs just aren't very good at close combat, and it's usually best to avoid it unless you're charging something weak like an Imperial Guard squad. Scarbad's perspective is a little different. Oi! Every orc was orc he knows what to do as soon as he's whelped. He runs up and gets stuck in by good. Sense to reason, doesn't it? But then, he would say that. He's an orc. Also, the accompanying image of what we presume to be Scarbad is one of the more unique takes on a 40k orc we've seen. We'd say it wasn't a very accurate depiction of an orc, but during Rogue Trader they weren't drawn particularly consistently. For example, all the images on screen right now come from the same book. So we'll cut the artist Del Harris some slack for his unconventional take. The final 40k article in Challenge was in issue 56 and was a scenario called Battle at Plateau. I know that title feels like it's missing a the, but Plateau is the name of the planet, so it's technically fine, so don't worry about it. The premise is that a new planet, previously cut off by warp storms, has been revealed to the Imperium. The planet, codenamed Plateau, is devoid of sentient life, but contains many ruins and there's been psychic energy detected. It's also rumoured that there may be advanced tech hidden down there. So the Imperium, and whatever factions are involved in your particular battle, decide to head down to the planet and see what they can steal. Heading towards the psychic disturbance, the opposing forces find that, as they near it, all of their anti-grav or flying equipment no longer work, so, you know, you can't use those in the game. On the board there are four large columns spitting out vortexes, all protecting some central ruins. The objective of the game is to get to those ruins and enter them, whereupon you'd go into an underground complex made out of Space Hulk tiles. If your one complaint about 40k is that a game only takes up one table, then this is the scenario for you. There's also more columns down there, but they spit lightning that can insta-kill any model that fails their saving throw. The first player who got a tech marine, or regional equivalent, to room 4 won the game, having discovered and identified some delicious piece of tech. Any non-tech marine could also do this, but it took an extra turn to declare victory. It's a neat idea with the multi-level game and all players rushing to the same goal, although they probably should have given it another pass on the editing since there's two distinct things with different rules that are both called poles and columns interchangeably. Like, once you've read through it once, it's easy to tell which one they mean from context, so it's not a big deal, but it's just... Why would you do it like this? The accompanying art by Rick Harris is pretty fun too. It's got a real Space Crusade kind of vibe to it, and this marine has one hell of a jawline putting old BJ to shame here. Oh, and hey, it only took them, like, 20 issues, but they finally managed to get one of their artists to draw a marine with a backpack. Huzzah! And we're done. We've, we've, we did it. We've covered every single Warhammer 40k article in Challenge. Well, okay, technically there are some issues that contain reviews for some Games Workshop products that we haven't covered, but we don't count those, and neither should you. It's been very interesting to see unofficial content from this era, since back then it would have been harder to come by. It's not like now, where the internet allows for easy sharing of such things. Something like Challenge would have been one of the few ways for you to see unofficial content from outside your own gaming group. Although, we do wonder how much of this stuff actually saw the tabletop. I know I've painted a little sister before, but has any brave soul ever actually tried to paint an Ice River Guard? In total, there were 53 issues of Challenge magazine, ending in issue 77 due to their ridiculous numbering. Around that time, financial troubles meant that Game Designers Workshop, and by extension their magazine, would officially close down in 1996, with the last issue of Challenge being released sometime in 1995. Although we focused this video on 40k for, you know, obvious reasons, the rest of the articles in these magazines are fascinating to read as well. Whether it be learning about games you've never played or possibly never even heard of, marvelling at the artwork both charmingly off-brand or rad as hell, 
or even just looking at the letters and classified ads. It all provides an interesting perspective, showing what has and hasn't changed in both RPGs and what we must upsettingly refer to as geek culture. Oof. Like, for example, that there's an old-school vagueness to some of the rules. But also in issue 42, there's a whole article intended as a parody of Star Trek The Next Generation that basically boils down to liberals ruined Star Trek. The more things change, the more they stay the same, as they say. Also, there was a swimsuit supplement in issue 60. It's not important to any point we're trying to make, but we felt the compulsion to share this information with you. It looks like Queen Gidget of Surf City is just about to lose an intra-species metahuman game of King of the Hill. As all the surfer boys say, she's the ginchiest. Do they though? If you want to read Challenge yourself, then PDFs are available for all the issues if you don't want to try and track down old copies on eBay. Annoyingly, we don't really know what happened to any of the people that wrote these articles. The only real exception is Craig Sheely, who wrote quite a few of the articles we've talked about here, who appears to be the same Craig Sheely that wrote for some GDW games as well as working on some Steve Jackson games, amongst other things. But that's really the extent of what we know. Maybe we missed something obvious, but we couldn't figure out what any of them are doing now. So if by some miracle any of the authors or artists from these articles see this video, then hello! We might have given some of them a bit of a good-natured ribbing, but we had a lot of fun reading your articles, even if we were around three decades late to the party. We know this was a really long video for such a niche topic, but honestly, it's just nice to have a series where we can do things like this, and thank you very much for watching the whole thing. There's no jokey end or anything, just sincerely, thank you for watching. Sorry, I thought that'd be, um... Yeah. I, I, cut, I think I cut myself from D4. <laughs>